playoffs. Playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? Lincoln Riley, a successful offensive coordinator, but had never been a head coach before. Lincoln Riley had a lot to deal with, you know. Happened to replace Shamaji P. Ryan, Joe Mixon, not to mention um, happened to replace Nick Basquin in August when Basquin, you know, one of the leading receivers for the Sooners, uh, was lost for the year due to injury. Then lost some key defensive players as well. You know, September, Oklahoma looks very good winning at Ohio State, but then had to survive a sluggish October after losing to Iowa State. And at that point, I thought their playoff chances were over. But for the next two weeks, you know, just getting by Texas and Kansas State, but then after that, not failing to cover the spread in the following games. You know, beating Oklahoma State, TCU back-to-back -back in the regular season, you know, taking care of business against West Virginia recently. And then on Saturday, December the 2nd in Arlington, Oklahoma winning their third straight Big 12 championship, but doing it this time in the Big 12 title game and their 11th Big 12 title overall and crushing TCU for the second time this season. First meeting, Sooners didn't need to score in the second half. But this one, they needed to perform very well in the second half offensively, and they did just that. We'll get more to that in a second. But 41-17, I'm, I'm so proud of these guys. I'm, I'm so proud of Sooner Nation. Big numbers today, by the way. And the one thing that I neglected, of course, I knew that there would be a lot of Sooner fans there. Of course, I didn't know it was going to be a 60-40 or 70-30 to 30 crowd split at Jerry World in favor of the Sooners. I had no idea about that. But the one thing I, I failed to um, remember was the fact that you know, there were a lot of Sooner fans in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know, a pretty large chapter of um, alumni in that area. And, of course, it was a convenient trip for them and a very happy one, too. Um, the Sooners, I'm telling you what, um, to make it to the playoff for the second time in the past three years, you just tip your hat off uh, to this proud program and like I said, you know, after the Iowa State game, things just could have completely fallen off. I mean, the wheels could have immediately come off with the, you know, Sooner wagon. But they were able, like I said, to get through a, a rough October and really shine, which this offense has done um, really strong to close out. And the defense, at times they bend. But you notice what? When, when the team needs it the most, the defense comes through. So for the Sooners, yeah, um, three things that are going to stick out to me as far as the Big 12 title game. The, the three big difference makers, in my opinion. Number one, the Sooners were the more balanced team. I mean, the Sooners had over 200 yards rushing and about 250 yards passing. And as super as Baker Mayfield is, we got another treat of Baker, you know, being Baker. You know, big plays. You know, four touchdown passes, two to Mark Andrews, one to Jones, one to Hollywood. Um, no interceptions. And he didn't exactly start off at his best, you know, completing um, uh, five of nine to start, but then completing seven of his next eight and really getting to a flow. But as super as Baker is, of course, he's going to win the Heisman, you know, next Saturday, and he'll be the sixth Heisman Trophy winner for the university. You have to have a running game. A solid running game. And entering this year, I didn't know what the running game was going to be like. Because, again, you don't have, you know, future NFL players on it, at least not as of now, um, in the caliber of Samaje P. Ryan and Joe Mixon. But this tells you just how damn important an offensive line can be. I mean, you look at Clemson, you look at Alabama, you look at Ohio State, the last three national champions, and – Offensive line is the one thing that sticks out the most. Not just a very good offensive line, but a great offensive line. OU has a great offensive line and a line that has depth. Baker Mayfield does not get those statistics. He doesn't get the glamour. He doesn't get the touchdown passes. He's not doing his celebratory moves without that offensive line. And again, it incorporates a terrific running game. Defenses can't just key in on Baker Mayfield. They got to worry about the other guys as well. And when your running game can get over five yards of carry against the second-best rushing defense in the country, which TCU is, and when you can put on an offensive display, which for the second time this season they've done against TCU, then you know you got something special. And this OU team, no question, is special. 
Yes, the passing game clicked today, and Baker Mayfield didn't throw an interception, but the ground game must be on, and Rodney Anderson once again was on today. And Trey Sermon coming in late to help out. And over 200 yards rushing against that Horn Frog defense. <laughs> tip your hat to those guys. Tip, tip, tip your hat to the Crimson and Cream. They were the balanced team. TCU was not balanced today. Most of their yardage, um, I think they had 300, just over 300 total for the game. Good job by the OU defense. Most of that was through the air. And, yes, Kenny Hill, the TCU quarterback, completed most of his passes. And he completed 27 of his passes. But he didn't even have 250 yards through the air. So, for the most part, it was short passing. Okay? And in the second half, he was not as effective as he was in the first. But, again, the, the ground game for TCU, um, for the large part, really didn't exist. In fact, Kenny Hill was the leading rusher today for the Horn Frogs, just over 50 yards for the QB. And I think Kyle Hicks had barely over 30 yards on eight carries. He only averaged four yards per carry. And he was the leading ground guy in terms of running backs. So not much of a ground game at all. It was mostly through the air for TCU. Again, the balance was there in big numbers on both sides for the Sooners. Number two, the start that OU got off to in both the first and second half. 17 points in the first quarter, 17 points in the third quarter. And that's something that's going to stick out to me big time. Now, I know the first drive OU did not get a touchdown, but they moved the ball down the field. Even though it was just three points to open the game, it was at least something. Remember, the Sooners never trailed in this game, not once. And you look at the start of the third quarter, TCU gets the ball down by just seven. Sooner defense steps up. And if you're going to criticize Mike Stoops when the defense doesn't do well, and rightfully so, you got to give Stoops credit when the defense does play well. And in that second half, they made adjustments. For one, they weren't missing the, um, the tackle immediately. And you, you remember in the first half, you know, how many missed tackles the first defender for the Sooners would register? It, it, it got very, very tiresome because TCU would take real short passes and runs that should have been contained and made it into bigger plays, keeping the chains moving. And that was a big reason why TCU got back into the game when it was 17-0 and made it 17-14. to But the second half, a three and out forced by the Sooner defense. And then how about when the Sooners were up 31-17, TCU driving in OU territory, fourth and one. In fact, it was fourth and inches. And I was surprised that TCU just did not sneak it or just didn't give it to a running back because all they needed was a few inches to keep the chains moving. Instead, they try a bootleg, they try a rollout, and it was Obo forcing Hill out of bounds, and then it was um, Motley, who I thought played one hell of a game as far as the corner position, um, finishing it off, making sure that Hill did not get the first down that OU took over, and it was quick striking ability, by the way, after the two, the first two TCU possessions in the third quarter, in which OU got the big touchdown passes from Mayfield to... Um, to Jones on the first one, and then the next one to uh, Hollywood, of course, to Marquise Brown. So the Sooners took advantage of TCU's failed first two drives of the second half. And I think the third thing that really sticks out, mistakes. OU made fewer mistakes in this game. TCU will be kicking themselves early for, you know, for, for things that were, were just stupid mistakes. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, – in the opening, the first play from scrimmage for TCU, you know, was 3 nothing OU, and Kyle Hicks, whoop, fumble, and you have a free gift right there for Caleb Kelly. He runs it back for a touchdown. That gave OU some early momentum, getting a 10 to nothing lead without the offense for the Sooners even getting into the end zone yet. So that was important. Another thing, too, uh, the other turnover in which the Sooners really set themselves up nicely with the cyber punt in which Jordan Thomas batted it back into the field of play. TCU had to start from their own three rather than the 20. And what happens? First play, we see Kenny Hill not keeping in mind the safety, throwing it down the sideline, and Johnson read it for the easy pick. That would lead to another score, a field goal by Cyber. So 10 points right there off of the turnovers, and penalties too really hurt TCU. One of the big moments in this game was when OU was up 17-14. to 14. TCU had scored back-to-back -to -back touchdowns. They kept the lead to three. TC crowd was, TCU crowd was in this ballgame. And then the kickoff return, 
by Bidette to the 35-yard line of OU with a face mask by TCU. Now OU has the ball at the 50. Same drive. Just a few plays later, fourth and one, TCU jumps off sides. Fresh set of downs for OU shortly after Mayfield to Andrews. So the penalties, seven penalties for TCU, only three for Oklahoma. So some of it in this game self-inflicted on Gary Patterson's squad, and they usually don't do that. Well, for TCU, it doesn't mean that they still won't get a nice bowl game. As a matter of fact, they could still end up getting a major bowl in New Year's Six game and ironically could be in the same stadium that they just played Oklahoma in. Talking about the Cotton Bowl in Arlington at Jerry World, New Year's Six game. If the committee decides to not select TCU, Horn Frogs, I think, will still remain in the Lone Star State and play South in San Antonio at the Alamo Bowl. It's going to be one or the other. I can't foresee it being any of the bowl game other than one of the two that I just mentioned. Well, for the Oklahoma Sooners, going to be smelling roses, New Year's Day, Pasadena, semifinal, two games away from the school's eighth national championship. And it looks like whether Oklahoma's a two or third seed, doesn't really matter what seed you are if you're two or three. The only difference is that, you know, if you're a higher seed, you get to wear the home jerseys. That's really about the only distinction between being a two or three in the playoff. Georgia, it looks like, will be the opponent. The Bulldogs, boy, did they get their revenge on Auburn in the SEC championship game, getting major separation from the Tigers in the second half of that contest. So, you know, Georgia, you know they're going to be fired up because if they beat Oklahoma in the semifinal, if that's who they end up playing, they'll get to come back home to Georgia for the national championship at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So that could be a little extra incentive for Georgia. By the way, the Sooners and the Bulldogs have never played each other. Never played each other with these two schools having as much tradition as they do. That's really hard to fathom, but look for a pretty good game between the Sooners and the Bulldogs in about a month. And that's the way it's it's looking. We're still a few hours away, by the way, from the committee's Final Four selection. We know Clemson's going to be number one. Uh, they did nothing at all to change that as they walled Miami. That game was over barely after it started, just kicking the canes all over the field. Who's going to be number four, though? Who's going to join the four-team party? Well, Ohio State, they think they're a serious candidate as they hand Wisconsin their first loss of the season, winning by six points. And by the way, we will go over the final results of my three picks in just a second. Will it be Ohio State or Alabama, who entered today number five in the country, but of course did not play in the SEC title game? If you want my opinion, if you go off the eye test who the more talented team is, you take Alabama. It's that simple. But if you take the more deserving team, it's Ohio State because they have a tougher schedule. And not to mention the fact that they just beat a previous unbeaten. And here's a big thing. They played a 13th game this year and won a conference championship. Alabama cannot say that. So most deserving would go to Ohio State. And if you put a gun to my head and said, who you think is going to go, who I think the committee will pick, I think they're going to pick Ohio State. But that's just one man's opinion. So the way I think it's going to lay out, Clemson, Either Georgia or Oklahoma at number two or number three, but it will be those teams at two and three regardless. And I think Ohio State's going to get number four. And I think the Alabama fans are going to be crying and bitching for a very long period of time. And maybe this will speed up the process for an eight-team playoff rather than four. Hey, if that's what it takes, I'm a proponent of it. Just a reminder, um, we will have – a special Heisman Trophy show coming soon, so make sure to check that out. Here are the final results, by the way, of my three picks. Guess what? After quite a few weeks, all season long, me against the coin, the winner, well, it's both of us. <laughs> I ended up going 2-0-1 this week, and the coin went 1-1-1. One, one, one. Um, I won on Clemson and on Georgia, and we end up tying, by the way, on Ohio State, Wisconsin, because Ohio State won by six, and Ohio State was giving six, so that is a push. So for the year, 23-18-1, identical records between me and the coin. Man, I'm proud of both of us. We were five games above 500 winning records. We'll take it. So thanks for watching my three picks all year long. Again, a split between me and the almighty coin. Nice shot. <laughs> Again, final score, the Sooners looking mighty good, mighty good. And going to the college football playoff, 41-17. Again, 
handling TCU. Big leap over the Horned Frogs again. Congratulations to OU, Big 12 champions. And, of course, in the college football playoff, most likely against Georgia in Pasadena. Boomer Sooner.